steam locomotives in miniature at the steam workshop, a compressed air test helping with a coal fire and some painting, but not necessarily in that order. What I'm currently doing is reattaching the running boards to the chassis because I had to remove the running boards entirely or at least the front part of the running boards to repair the pipe and actually make a new pipe because one got lost and this is the pipe that takes the steam from the superheater down to the cylinder after the regulator. And in this particular clip I'm rubbing down the paintwork or what's left of the paintwork on the other running board. This running board shouldn't have to be removed because the pipe appears to be okay and doesn't need any repairs. With a piece of coarse sandpaper, this is actually emery cloth, I'm removing the paint where it's damaged at the front of the running board. And if you look further back on the running board above this piece, you will notice that I've completely removed the paint from this area because it was very bad. And this isn't brilliant, but it should be okay. So once I've removed most of the paint with the coarse sandpaper, I'm using wet or dry paper to feather the existing paint into the metal. In this clip, I've attached some temporary silicone rubber pipes and I'm going to attempt to run the engine. But before that, I would like to apologize for the grievous error that I made in the previous episode. In the previous episode, I said that this was a V2 locomotive and I was wrong. I asked John at the steam workshop all about it and he said, no, it's a V1 because it is a tank engine a three-cylinder tank engine that sounds like this. And it seems to run quite well. It hasn't been run for quite a long time and things were a bit gummed up to start with. But with the oil that I put on the bearings, everything soon freed off and it really does run well. Just to get out of the workshop and the paint fumes, I went to have a look to see what Dave was doing. And Dave was trying to light a fire in this sweet pea locomotive. Without much success initially because the damper just kept falling into the shut position. That was a simple fix. I just bent the pin so that it sat in the right position on the quadrant that sticks out of the firebox. And in no time at all, the fire started to pick up. Then I went just inside the workshop to see what John and Mark were doing. And they were working on this very large foul attraction engine. And in this clip, John's fitting the new piston that he made for the cylinder. Because after the bore was cleaned up using a cylinder horn, the piston wasn't the best fit in the world, and it wasn't very well made, and it was made out of aluminium. So John made a complete new cast iron piston with new rings. And now the piston fits very well. So the high pressure cylinder should perform much better than it did originally. Mark had put a lot of time into the smoke box door ring. And now the seal of the smoke box door onto the smoke box ring is really good. Meanwhile, just outside, the fire's looking pretty neat in this sweet pea as well. Sweet peas are very strange locomotives. They have a different kind of a boiler setup to a normal locomotive. This is a marine boiler, and the good thing about it is, if you get a problem with the fire, you lift the entire assembly out of the firebox. And there aren't many boilers where you can do that. You just lift out the firebox, as you can see, if you tip it slightly to the left, the firebox assembly kind of unhooks from the main boiler, and you just remove the whole thing and put it on the floor. Instant heat reduction. Generally speaking, firing a sweet pea boiler with this firebox arrangement is just slightly different to firing a conventional boiler. The position of the fire grate is much higher than it would be on a normal boiler. So you can put a little bit more coal into the firebox of a sweet pea, and eventually the fire will become like a big inferno that raises plenty of steam inside the sweet pea boiler. Dave went on to perform the steam test and it was very successful. The customer picked up the engine 
and was delighted with it. I didn't video this bit because I forgot to press record, but I'm really sorry about that. I went back into the workshop and continued working on this V1 locomotive. And at the moment, in this clip, I'm cleaning up the reach rod that connects the reversing lever to the valve gear. As I mentioned earlier, I got the name of this engine wrong. It is apparently a V1, not a V2 or a V3. And for some reason, I'm not familiar with several classes of steam locomotives, and I don't know why, because when I was a kid, me and my friend used to go to Holbeck engine sheds, climb over the wall, and mess about in the locomotives, which were mainly Jubilees and Black Fives and various other ones, which was really good fun until the engine shed staff chased us away. So I was familiar with most of the common engines that ran in the area where I lived, but I think what it was, there was a certain time in my life where I really couldn't care less what the engines were because I'd discovered the opposite sex. So climbing over walls and getting really dirty in an engine roundhouse was replaced by attempting to climb over walls in an attempt to meet girls at a local girls' school. And regrettably, not with that much success when I think back, I should have stuck to steam locomotives. But here I am many, many years later getting my hands dirty working on miniature versions of them. At the moment, I'm removing the draw hook. On a draw hook, there's normally a spring and a washer, which acts as a bit of a shock absorber for when the engine's pulling. Although this is the front one, so it's not really going to be put to much use. The reason for removing the draw hook is because I'm going to thoroughly clean up the buffer beam at the front. And as you can see, I've removed some of the paint from the buffer stocks, and I will be rubbing down the paint after I've degreased it. Ready for a new coat of paint. And as you can see, on the buffer stocks I've removed all of the paint because they were in a bit of a bad state. As a degreaser, I'm using panel wipe, which as far as I can tell by the smell of it, is exactly the same stuff as lighter fluid that I used to put in my Zippo lighter when I used to smoke. So I'm making sure that there's no naked lights anywhere near the bench at the moment, otherwise it'll just go woof, and I'll lose part of my beard, moustache, and probably my eyebrows as well. As you can clearly see in this clip, I'm painting this with a paintbrush. There are a couple of reasons for this. I don't always like to see a sprayed finish on a locomotive because it can be too perfect and it makes the locomotive look wrong. This is a very old locomotive, so parts of it are a little bit on the rough side and a beautifully painted running board using spray paint is not what I want. And the other reason, because I'm sure some viewers are thinking, why am I using such a small brush? Well, the smaller the brush, the smaller the brush marks. The brush marks from a brush of this size are almost scaled to the engine. And if you take a close look at a full-size steam locomotive, you will see brush marks, because full-size steam locomotives were generally painted with paint brushes and not sprayed. It's worth mentioning that it's very important to make sure that the paint isn't too thick, but as this paint has been sprayed out of an aerosol can, into the cap that fitted on top of the aerosol can, it's not very thick paint, and it flows very well. And the paint that I'm using is a sort of light grey colour, and why is it a light grey colour? Because it is called 1K Etch Primer, from a company called HMG. I'd like to thank the viewers for the information that I received when I put out a request for how to paint brass. I didn't really get the correct answer, and I still am formulating some ideas but I did learn that this kind of etch primer is really designed for steel. It has a phosphate in it which sticks to steel, or should I say ferrous metals, but it's not brilliant at sticking to brass. So I'm looking at alternatives for making paint stick to brass, and when I find one, I'll make a video about it. Tomorrow's video you will find extremely interesting. I'm really looking forward to making that. It is something entirely different to this. So for now, I'm going to bid you farewell and say thanks for watching, and I hope you found this useful.